You can see me? Leo, you can see me? Yeah, yeah. Do, uh, do I look at come the around, dark? Come around and look, you'll see exactly where I'm. Go around and look at that side. Do I look too dark? Because no, no, they... it's, it's too much more light sensitive. It looks, it looks pretty good. Come around this side just for a second, you can see. Uh, Hi, Clint. It's rolling now, though. You're on video. Nice. Nice. You know, I saw. Link is one of my best friends uh, in all my life, and he's my collector, isn't it? Oh, no. Hi. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Yes. Yeah. 
my work. So Greg has a gallery here that you know, Full Fathom Five is the name. And uh, I also have a friend who's taking, Leo Kovac, who's taking pictures, a uh, film of my talking. So it's my first time, I might confess, in Zoom, so I was very, very anxious, but now I find it very interesting because I can see people who live so far away. So thank you. And uh, yes, I'm Italian, and, but I spent many years in the United States. I've been studying here uh, at the School of Visual Arts at Columbia University, first in Berkeley University, because I'm an art historian, first of all. So I, I have a master in art history. That's why my work uh, is very much based on uh, going to the past and trying to see what in the past is also contemporary. Uh, I, I don't consider the past a tradition. I consider the past as a reality. Our DNA, it belongs to our DNA in a way, and I consider our history uh, a platform where we work on and uh, and something that uh, a sort of skeleton of uh, our culture. So, so the way I work on um, my past, I'm talking about my history, the, the, the paintings that you see the best, that we will explain them, they belong to a series that I did about uh, uh, the School of Athens by Raphael. And before this, I've been working on Leonardo da Vinci twice. One, it was a, a work about the Battle of Aguiari, which is a, a, a lost uh, a mural uh, in uh, Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. And then recently, I did almost again to try to understand the features of Leonardo as a young man. So, so my idea of uh, going back to the history is almost a pop, pop art, I would say something that has to be, you know, uh, brought into, my, into our uh, life as if it's, it was uh, uh, a real thing, contemporary, that we can really have uh, a relationship uh, nowadays without thinking that it's uh, something old. Uh, being Italian, I have been living, surrounded by art uh, of the past. But I also think that uh, um, I'm very interested in any kind of culture, uh, historical background of any kind of culture, even those who don't have the Leonardo da Vinci or the Renaissance, because it's any country where I go, um, I find I like history, even any places, even uh, here in, in Innsbruck, I, I really, would like to have more contact uh, with the um, with the background, with the historical uh, platform, as I say, in this this time. So um, I I decided to show you the the two of these three pieces actually here in this gallery. There are three because I I. Uh, I like zoo, but I would rather show you the size also and, and, and the way I did. This series, is, which is called The Philosopher's Clock, is, um, has been painted on canvases uh, without stretchers. A sort of, uh, you know, like a loose material that has to be um, it started in a way and then it finished in another. In other words, it's, uh, all this painting that you see, it's, it's sort of notebooks. I did 46 pages like, like in a book. And, uh, and why? Because Victoria, I... Victoria, Victoria, yeah. yeah. Victoria, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh yeah, when I, when I move, okay. okay. In front of the camera. Yeah, if you can stay with your mouth facing the camera. Ah, okay, cool. okay, sorry. Um, That's a, no, well, you can see in my back, and then you see. No, I want to. I wanted to explain. It's very important to see the size and also the 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 way the the, the 
the kind of uh, works, because it's not really a painting on a stretcher, is uh, a sort of uh, um, a row um, a cloth, a row piece of uh, cotton, uh, which which was conceived to be like a, a page, and I work on them uh, with choke, with uh, like just uh, sketching notes. So I studied a school of art. What is the school of art? Then is, is a is a, uh, a pretty important fresco. This is a fresco because Raphael uh, did fresco. Um, uh, not like Leonardo, I used the word mural because he never Leonardo never. Uh, painted fresco, but mural, and actually one, uh, two, the Last Supper, uh, and this, uh, the School of Athens is in the uh, Vatican uh, Palace in Rome, and uh, uh, it's a scene, it's a theatrical scene where you can see all the philosophers and mathematicians all together on a big stairs. Um, I don't know if you ever seen it, but you can um, see it. And I, um, I uh, in, uh, not really, I wouldn't say interpreted uh, the work. Yeah, we have the, the real thing. I don't know if you ever have had the opportunity to. It's great to see. This is the original. Yeah, this is great. Can you see those? Yes. Mostly. Yeah. So, so this is a, a very interesting uh, uh, subject for me because when I say that I actually pick some historical subject, it's because uh, the contemporaneity uh, gives me a hint to go backwards. So, in other words, I sometimes I pick a subject in my experience and, and instead of uh, working only on my present time, I go backwards. I, I want to make an example. I started doing a lot of battles when uh, there was this, uh, the war called Desert Storm. I think it was in 1992 or something. And, uh, and so I worked on this idea of battle. Battles is gender, as a gender in, in the painting, in the art history. And then I get, I, I, from there, I went backwards and I went to work on uh, Leonardo da Vinci, the Battle of Agnello. So the same thing for this uh, work by Raphael. This, uh, I don't know if you can see, but there are a lot of people, more than 50 characters, and they belong to a, a period of time which goes from the 350 before Christ to the, to the year 1000. So they all talk together, and they come from different culture, although they all belong to the Mediterranean area of ancient philosophers, mathematicians, and uh, uh, Mm, scientists, uh, so-called scientists, but that's, it's not really what we can call scientists now. But anyway, what I want to say that this idea of being contemporary in, uh, uh, in an anachronogic, chronological time, I mean, there's not chronology. I mean, everybody talking together and uh, everybody belongs to uh, different times, different epochs, and uh, also different uh, countries. So it was very close to my idea of uh, diversity being all together and sort of globalization of the culture. So many years ago I started to think of doing actually a sort of theatrical piece of this, which means to find the words of these people who are talking together. And I thought, well, maybe there is a dialogue that I can find, can look for, and uh, a dialogue that is nowadays with the, the content, nowadays content, but, but took, took by people who lived many, many years ago. But then instead I found, uh, I, am, I have to, uh, tell you something, before the pandemic I spent five years of my life nomadic, with no house, no studio. 
uh, I like to work uh, on the site, which means where I found a place that give me inspiration and give me the possibility to have new ideas, I stop and work. So for me, that that's very important because it uh, the atmosphere. I look for an atmosphere, you know, and, and that's the reason I am. Have a question. Yeah. Is the, is that nomadic piece? working on canvas that's not stretched, is there a relationship there? There is, there is, because all my paintings, so sometimes they belong to a, they are put in a bag, I show you. For example, the School of Athens, this, this series, which is a 46 pieces on different kind of canvas, some of them, is, uh, some canvas are thicker, some other, uh, they call musli, 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 it's a sort of uh, very light, huh? How do you say? Yeah. yeah. It's Most, right, right. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lighter fabric. I want to show you because I should have a a photo of the bags. I put everything in the bags. I don't think it's in there. No, so anyway, there there is not I guess it's not. a bag. Um, all these paintings are in a kind of a gallery uh, in uh, New York, but they are all uh, put in a bag. So first of all, because I can uh, move easily, that's true. But also because, you know, I did many, many work on stretchers and, uh, well, any, any, any project has its own biology in a way. So the, the, the portrait of Leonardo da Vinci that you saw at the Commons, uh, this summer uh, were uh, done on, on paint, on, on canvas, on stretch canvases. So yes, uh, yeah. You can also roll them up. I've seen you do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, yeah. But but if, if, it, if, see, this kind of work was. I don't know if you ever heard. In Italy, we have the word kind of action to explain uh, those uh, uh, people who used to go to do theater in the streets, you know, in the street, yeah. Yeah. and they they hang in the streets uh, with the with the a, a chart in the past in the uh, one century ago. This kind of uh, uh, piece of cloth that, that they used to to have a sort of background. So, uh, I don't know the right uh, name. The, the, the theater people in the street, uh, street, yeah. street... Uh, it would be like a portable set. Right. Uh, uh, portable <laughs> set. Right. They are itinerant artists. Right, itinerant, exactly. exactly. Artists. I actually like more itinerant artists than nomadic. <laughs> so, so going back to this uh, series, the the interesting uh, cont the content is complicated. The content is complicated, and there are many many subjects. So I start, let's say that I studied this uh, subject, the the original by by uh, Raphael. I studied instead of just reading books. Every content, every little subject I drew and I painted as if I was talking to a class. Actually, I was talking to me. I was teaching to myself and to other people that virtually I could have in front of me. So that's the result of the difference of the, all those, uh, those uh, 46 pieces. They are pretty big. These are the smallest. The, uh, the other are three meters, well, I go by meters, but anyway. Uh, I also uh, gave a hand to show some of these um, uh, works uh, on, online so they are more visible. What, what you see here in the back, for example, this, is just a general view of this. I wanted to show, can you see me here? Yeah. Um, I wanted to show you how I, I I, uh, I, I wrote, I used chalk to wrote, it's just like uh, a notebook, right? A notebook where I used many media. I studied photography and filmmaking for three years, so I'm very, very interested in using um, different media. 
but I, I consider myself a mixed media artist. So, for example, can you follow me here? Uh, just to talk about the technique I use for this painting. This, this, the black background that you see, can you see the black, the black part of the, the painting yeah. online? Okay, that's uh, the photographic emotion. Emotion? Do you, you, co you correct, correct my, my English, it's not perfect. So, so this is a... Yeah. Old, Well, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, could be better. Could, could be better. Could be better. So anyway, this this is a, a very simple simple photographic emotion with a uh, a product that you you can find uh, anywhere. Liquid light. I don't know. Probably we have a guy a guy is a photographer. Maybe. <laughs> He knows what I'm talking about. And uh, so, what I mean, I like to use many kinds of different medium, even uh, uh, inside the paintings, many kinds of different colors. So I use oil and acrylics because every medium, every kind of uh, colors has its own uh, physicality, has its own uh, effect. So, I um, asked, I, I told him that um, I sent him some of my other works. But An example of one of the main subjects of humanistic culture, the philosopher and mathematician, the science and the, and the literature together. That's what very, not literature, sorry, philosophy and math, 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 mathematics and and geometry mostly, I, I'll tell you all the subjects who are, that's very important. So the game and uh, the fascinating thing that I've done was just to look for the resemblance of the single uh, philosopher and where Raphael could have done, could have had, could have had a model somehow, he didn't. Uh, there was a way to understand the feature of somebody before photography, let's say. It, nothing, nothing to do actually with the fact that we have to wait for photography to, to, to draw or to paint someone who uh, we don't have a model in front of us because we don't know how he was look like, right? Uh, well, they had other systems. Well, the, the Greeks uh, cast the, the, the sculpture the, in, in the ancient Greek, they are also, you know, real cast. How do you say when you cast the picture of a person? But in this case, the Raphael had found a, a, a way which, which belonged to the, uh, um, uh, the, the kind of uh, the art of the past, which means the art based on the a theatrical representation. Even in the, uh, mostly I would say, not even in the uh, satyr, in the, in the religious uh, subject. Uh, this is not a religious subject, but the idea is more or less the same. But we also have something more realistic. I mean, if you paint a Madonna, they were a cliche, a sort of cliche, and they had models, sometimes they have young men in the bottega, in the workshop, and they were, they were dressed as a woman. Uh, in this case, he had to understand the feature of the single philosopher, but also to give the resemblance in some way. You have to recognize that that guy was Plato and that guy was Aristotle. How? If you didn't know the face. You can tell me, well, there were a lot of uh, Greek, uh, the Roman Greek, uh, Greek Roman uh, sculptures in Rome. It's true. Rome was a museum on open sky. You could you could just walk in the street and see what we now see in the museums. But all, most of those uh, uh, archaeology was not catalogued. It was didn't belong to a real archive. There was not a museum until the 50s, 60s. Uh, 1560 with uh, Pope Julian um, who actually started a real museum. 
So, so the, the, these ancient uh, uh, um, uh, sculptures of uh, um, they found um, actually even in the Garden of the Vatican, just on those years in 1510, uh, they were they were more or less. Um, interpreted, and not all of them, they have doc a, a, a real sign, signature or a, a, a documentation written um, on, on, on the um, carved in, in, in the marble. Um, and so that was the difficulties. But they knew the features of those philosophers because there was a, a what we call anecdote. Do you know what the word means? An anecdote. So an anecdote is a bit. A little story. Well, we, they had medals. They had coins. Uh, they had coins. They had description. They had description for, from uh, uh, the past. For example, here in the school of art, there is the. The, here it's a little bit uh, uh, outlined by me, but in the uh, end, if you want to put, uh, I would put, I will show you the drawings, the drawings that you, yeah, um, here, uh, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, well, I see myself, but I can see those. Those sketches looks like a cartoon in my style of drawing, but those are uh, some of the characters. And how do you say that that character is uh, Plato instead of Aristotle? Uh, they knew the description, what they had said before, and ever. They, they knew some manuscripts also, uh, especially for uh, the very ancient, um, um, that's more in the religious, on the religious side, uh, they were uh, miniatures uh, in the manuscript. Like, for example, Averroi. Averroi, uh, it was a, a actually a Jew, Juridic, and uh, a philosopher uh, from the Arabian culture, but he, Lived in the, he was born and lived in Cordoba, Spain, when Spain was out, uh, uh, after the, um, under the Arabs. So he uh, had, was uh, depicted by uh, a, 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 a painter and a manuscript, and it was a very gentle, in fair, with fair feature, gentle, blonde, and he was depicted by, by was painted by, by Raphael as a dark with mustache, like, you know, like <laughs> a completely different person because the idea was to show an Arab uh, feature. So, so what actually was fascinated for me uh, it was to find out that Raphael did a real casting as we do now for films and for theater. He uh, hired, uh, so, to, so to speak, he hired people who lived at the court of Pope Julius II and friends to uh, uh, play, to act as if they were Plato, Leonardo, etc. And if they didn't know exactly the feature, how they looked, he used two ways to ident identify a person. One way was uh, to give, uh, put an object in the hands of, uh, for example, Aristotle. Uh, yeah, well, Aristotle has the ethic, the book of ethics in his hand. And the person Historians said that uh, they have a theory that the person who hears Aristotle was uh, Sebastiano da Sangallo, who was an architect. And, and this architect had a nickname in those years, I mean, an architect of the Renaissance, and the nickname was Aristotle. 
So the book to identify the person, the, the character, and the nickname very much. Let's say, let's for example take Michelangelo. His uh, this is vile, the purple sp splash that you see here, and uh, in the uh, in the original is is a in the front. In, in the front here, if you see, you can see here. Can we, can we see that uh, in? Yeah. Uh, I've got to. Can you uh, see me? I've got to run it. Okay. Uh, well, never uh, mind. I will show you after. But that, anyway, Michelangelo was a figure in so front. Are you going to be here. like a backup? You, this, you, you can see just uh, the outline, uh, say. And Michelangelo uh, was, as a young man, you know? was depicted as a 30 years or less, less than 30 years. And you don't recognize Michelangelo at all. The features are not those of uh, what you, we know about Michelangelo were much older with the beard and not, not many hair and much hair um, on his head. In any case, uh, Michelangelo has a role. I mean, uh, what Raphael wanted to do was to celebrate the major artist of, uh, of his time and uh, a dress like and uh, acting like the major philosopher of the world. So Michelangelo was Heraclitus, uh, and Heraclitus was uh, called Loscuro. That means someone who's not very social, very um, uh, reserved, not very outgoing. And that was Michelangelo was named, the nickname was, you know, Loscuro. So, so we see that, that to, to identify a person, you use an outfit that belongs to a person, so a symbol, sort of symbol, and a nickname. And there are other examples uh, for this. So it's the only person who really could, you could say, that looks like the real, the real thing, the real uh, person is Socrates, for some reason. I, I didn't read anything why Socrates looks like Socrates. Uh, who, uh, Socrates had a strange, a big face. But for example, Plato, Plato has to be, uh, was to be uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, as we know, with long beard, long hair, but it's not Leonardo da Vinci, the model of the School of Athens. I mean, nobody really posed for Raphael, <laughs> no way. First of all, because they didn't, eat, uh, they didn't meet each other. They didn't have Zoom, and they barely, <laughs> they barely met each other. Uh, probably Raphael, they knew each other. They knew each other, and uh, uh, they met each other when they had an opportunity to work, uh, for example, for the Pope. But Leonardo never worked for the Pope. He went to Rome. But he never worked for the Pope, so so uh, Raphael worked for the Pope, but with other artists like Giulio Romano and Sodoma. So so uh, and uh, they did travel. They did travel a lot. We think if they didn't travel, they didn't have the planes. But he, they really did. But uh, uh, we know that that Raphael met Leonardo uh, when he was about 50 years old in uh, 1506 when they were bought in Florence, uh, for what reasons. So, in, so the, the, the character who has actually has um, uh, uh, Plato, in, in the Greek Roman sculpture, the bust they, they had, uh, is a totally different person, totally. So why Leonardo is Plato? Well, Leonardo lived in a period uh, which there was the Neoplatonist. It was the, the school of uh, Plotino, a Neoplatonist in Florence was the major, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, uh, philosophy background uh, for those humanistic uh, uh, intellectuals there, not just painters, but uh, uh, a poet and a writer. So, so he was considered, and also Plato 
in the School of Athens has a, an attitude. He, he really has a, a indicate the sky. So Leonardo was considering, you know, a major uh, the, the, how do you say, they are theoretian, right? So, so every character here has his own. There is a Pythagora which has a, the table near, a, this is the group of Pythagora, which has a table with their uh, theory of the army and music. And we know that Pythagora uh, uh, designed that. Uh, um, so also we have another character in the low in in on the if you see the the, the fresco on the right side is Euclid. Euclid? Do you say that in English? Euclid is a uh, the famous um, uh, geometer and Heraclitus. Uh, you you Euclid. Yeah. yeah, how do you say in English? Help me, help me with the names in English because I I know the names in Italian. But so how do you pronounce it in Italian? Because it's closest to the original. Euclide. 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 Yeah, it's the, you know the geometry? Yeah. Euclidean geometry? That's it. So this yeah. is a, the group here. The group on this side. Yeah. So the man who actually acts as Euclid is, is Bramante. Bramante uh, is the architect of Saint Peter in Rome. Architect, yeah, the, uh, the, the the architect of Saint Peter in Rome. That is so fascinating. Yes, yes. So, so this is was my game to find a, to um. And can you can you please uh, give me the drawings that uh, that I send you the drawings those sketches on canvas the drawings that yeah yeah right well this is this is a big the big the biggest paintings that I've done the one you saw so and, and this drawing wait, Victoria, can you can you see you on the screen can you see yourself or can you see the drawings? I can see myself. No, I can see the drawing and the little square with myself. But How about that? Can you see the draw can you see the drawings now? Yeah, uh, not completely. Because I wanted to explain, for example, the band that is at the top of your left is is the uh, uh, the can you see? Yeah, yeah. In blue. In blue. Is the, Diogenes? Diogenes. Diogenes, yeah. oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, let's go a little, uh, well, I can't see because I see the, the square. See, look at this uh, young lady here, the, the face, it looks like a cartoon with blonde hair. Yes. And that, that is a, one of the most intricate, intricate uh, figures of the old, uh, uh, fresco because it's the only woman and many many historians for centuries said no that's not a woman because it was not even possible that there was a woman who was not a Madonna or a, you know a religious figure that was a, a mathematician instead there was a famous mathematician and philosopher in the past in Alessandria d'Egitto uh, Egypt, yeah, Alexander the Egypt. Uh, that, then, that woman was Ipatia, Ipatia, to you? Correct me if I don't say the right name in English. Ipa Ipatia d'Alexandria means um, uh, Ipatia from Alexandria. She was a philosopher, a mathematician, and a martyr. She was killed, uh, actually, among the Catholics. Uh, the Christians, and and she is really, really well for us. Uh, for many of us who lived in the '70s, was was a symbol of feminist. Uh, I patient. I think you say hi, patient. I patient. Oh, with an H. With an H, yeah. exactly. I there is the feminist journal of philosophy. Right. That name. That's it. So, 
But but look, this this woman doesn't look like Hypatia because we don't know. Uh, we don't have any image of Hypatia. But but he he is is, is being painted among uh, with Pythagoras, Parmenides, and uh, and uh, in the group of the mathematician and and lawmakers. Well, what I wanted also to tell you that the composition, the composition of these uh, frescoes is interesting because um, it's made of groups, single groups, and every group has different kind of philosopher and a reason why they are talking together, right? So, so in the group of the mathematician, more than the geometry, uh, the, 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 there is a, 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 this a feminine female figures. For many years, they thought he was a young man, a young man, actually a relative of, of uh, Pope Julius II, but it doesn't make much sense. It might have been, other historians said, it might have been the symbol of purity, of virgin, uh, virginity. Uh, I don't think it really makes any sense also because there are no other symbol figures that symbolize something else except them at Agora, uh, the school of Athens, the school of... So it must be a, a, a female figures. And uh, under the Pope Julius II, the Hypatia of Alexander from Alexandria was very well known, not just as a ma because of her martyrdom, but because her uh, philosophy and, uh, and her, um, uh, as a mathematician, especially. So, so that was my really work for uh, almost two years to, to play with this character, with the casting, as if I was doing a sort of film, you know, like drawing like a film. And it was really, really, really interesting, really fascinated because, because I could understand how, uh, uh, how a portrait, when you, when you draw a portrait, you want to be uh, similar, right? You want to do something similar, but in this case, similarity doesn't really matter. What matters is the, the meaning of the person, who is really the person, and who is the person in his life, what communicates. Um, and that's why the object, that's why the, the book of ethics in the end of Aristotle, the harmonic uh, table, near Pythagoras, that's why other objects that you can see all over in the ends of the, of, of the characters. And that's why the nickname, you know. So, so I, I really, I really uh, enjoyed this uh, uh, um, work on allusivity, I'll, I'll be allusive, you, you, you know, be allusive. And Another thing that I've done with a lot of passion was to translate or transport the past into my daily life in a way, but also into the contemporary culture. As I said before, that we think that history is just something old, but it's not true. And the allusivity, and for example, this subject about portraits is very important. Let's, let's take some, uh, some little steps. We are used to see uh, a symbolic, idealistic portrait in the ancient Greek uh, statue. And then uh, we, we, go through, we go through the history, we see the portraits of uh, major painters, uh, portrait commissioned by Prince, by uh, uh, famous characters. And then we go uh, up to now to the photography, right? And with photography, we said, well, photography replaced the, uh, the painters, the portrait, the, uh, painting portraits. And then 
nowadays, portrait is not even uh, so important except for the selfie, for the snapshot, and well, of course, for beautiful, wonderful photography, let's say, for the art. The art aspect of photography is not even important for the resemblance if you think that even in criminology, you don't use anymore the forensic drawing, but you use a DNA to uh, identify a person. So, so nowadays we are almost uh, in a way of being iconoclastic in the sense of portrait and I, especially in the field, uh, uh, the field of criminology. So I study all this and I wrote a text uh, about all this assertive uh, uh, going through uh, the uh, fresco of Raphael and up to the forensic uh, outline and drawing that we are used to. So this was my my game, let's say, between the past and, and the present. So, um, so if you want to ask me a question, and for example, in this drawing that you have now, you can see Plato uh, with the finger like that, with the, this gesture, and it's in red and violet, and, and uh, Aristotle, which is in uh, blue and green. And another thing very interesting was the theory of colors. That's why also there was a subject that took me from the past to the present, it was the colors. The colors that he used um, uh, mostly um, um, Raphael, uh, didn't have any symbolic reason. The Aristotle was depicted by others before him in another colors. So the composition of colors is what we, we could call an absurd composition, you know, um, with no a, a, a symbolic uh, a meaning as we have instead where if we see the the vest, the clothed of uh, a Madonna, for example. When you paint a Madonna, you use the blue uh, for the veil, mostly. Uh, there is a little bit of code, a code in using the colors. In this case, you have uh, really a, a vast range of colors, and it's really beautiful, the composition. And in those years, they didn't really need the theory of color when during the modern age uh, in the last century with the Bauhaus or, uh, where there was a real theory of color. Those, way, those years though, they knew, they had a new, for example, in the humanistic period, they, there was the, the theory of colors came from the seven colors of Aristotle. So I also studied the whole theory of colors again. It was a subject that I studied at the university. I studied again, but using the, the colors in my paintings. See, using the colors, well, you can see only now the drawings that, uh, and not, I don't know if you see this, but all these colors that they used, and uh, uh, the red, the, the green, cadmium green for Socrates, the blue and the green for Aristotle, uh, the red, they are the, I mean, I, I respect, huh? Excuse me. Oh. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah. What I wanted to tell you that uh, I didn't have a real imagine, I didn't invent anything. I didn't interpret anything. I just started something doing, uh, painting well and drawing uh, as a tool to study, as a way of studying. Did you say, Victoria? Yep. Did, did, uh, this is Becca. Uh, did you uh, say that you wrote a, a text that explained um, explain your trajectory and, and, and how you um, came to this painting? 
Yes, I, I wrote a text. I wrote a text that should be published in a book, and uh, this text is 22 pages, more or less, and it, it's going to be translated into English. I wrote it in Italian, and I really hope I have to, because you see, in a book, you can see also, I, while I was painting and I was studying this phrase, and I was talking to myself, and I had footage, and uh, you see also, I will put on YouTube, I will download on YouTube some films that I'm going to do, because I took a lot of pictures, I took myself working, because these pieces are not like finished, you know what I mean? They are notebooks, and every time I went into the studio, I remember I had a, a very nice studio in Union Square in New York, 41 Union Square, for two years and more, and I had things. I drew on top of other things because the idea was not to create a rigid image, but something that moves, something that was changing, layers of layers of uh, uh, trying to understand of drawings and uh, other uh, other uh, colors to uh, trying to understand what I was doing, you know? So it was really so, a work so in progress. Victoria, I have a, qu I have a question, thought, uh, interpretation of what you're saying. Um, am I getting this right when I, when I hear you saying that your delve into the history of this work is in, you almost are sketching through to understand that historical context and and sketching through to, to sort of feel what's happening? Is, is that close to right? Yes. Yes, uh, it's right. You I mean, it, it was a surprise every time. It was, it's like drawing uh, a feeling of, of uh, discovery. I didn't want to make an yes. opera. You know, I didn't want to make a masterpiece. I never, actually never thought in my life of making any really work of art. To me, art is like discovering something. You know, like when, when you yes. look for a treasure, like you look for the treasure, and uh, the, this, the way of discovering is a process. So everything was based yes. on a process. You know, a method uh, that I have, a study things. And also that's what allowed me actually to move and to move and to be nomadic because the process is such, it, it deals with movement, you know, and when you meet people, so meeting people for me, it's very important to be open, to be open. I like everything. I mean, I'm really open up to from realistic art to conceptual art, to any kind of media because everything is alive. Yes, yes. And, and I'm so curious about this idea of like, it sounds like your experience and what, where you are and, and who you're meeting and, and the sort of historical text that you're thinking about within that is, has COVID sort of shaped your work? Has it closed down your world? Has it opened up your world? Like, How is the effect of COVID on that, that process? Well, let, let's, let's say that um, I work on different projects at the time. For example, I'm here in Isper yeah. because I started in 2011, many years ago, to work on the Atlantic Ocean. And I haven't finished yet. Actually, it's a big, it's a big idea because I I worked on uh, I worked on Atlantic Ocean on the, in this way I was on a ship on a cargo ship that had crossed the Atlantic Ocean from uh, Holland to Cleveland and Ohio, and uh, it was my first uh, my first idea and the the the, the, the um, project's uh, title is uh, sailing away to paint to the sea. And the idea was re really to paint the sea, but not from the shore, but from the middle of the ocean. And I did it. And, and what is the name of the title of that project? Sailing, sailing Away 
to pay, voglio viaggiare su una nave per dipingere il mare. Oh. <laughs> so, so from there I went to Iceland to in winter uh, 2015 I went so I started that that uh, project on the ocean but I study everything about the history of the Atlantic Ocean which is a very important history because of the colonies the colonial period the slavery and everything I mean what happened on that ocean is everything all, even on the Pacific Ocean but the history of the Atlantic Ocean really changed the Western, the modern world, because especially when the English defeated the Spanish, so um, and took over on the in the commerce, and and then I study all this slavery thing that is not just uh, um, as we think; it's uh, much more old. It's older and ancient. Like uh, well, for example, when the Dutch started to to um, uh, sail uh, along the coast of the uh, West uh, uh, um, Africa. So I study all this, but but I still work. I started working on the light, on the light and the colors. And I can tell you that in the middle of the ocean, well, Greg was the captain, or uh, and he knows what it means to see the colors in the middle of the ocean. That's beautiful. And when I came, um, uh, I went off the, the boat after six hours of the ship um, in Cleveland uh, after 16 days, and I didn't want to get off. I wanted to stay in. And then I said, well, I have to do more. And after four years, well, I was doing other projects, that, and after four years, I went to uh, Iceland in the north of Iceland, in front of Greenland, Greenland, and in winter. It was uh, pretty hard for me coming from a, a Mediterranean country, but I wanted to do that. <laughs> and so then, then I, I, I did some, something, um, also studied the history of Icelandic people, and then I went to Stonington, Maine, and from Stonington I came here to Eastport, and I saw uh, something special of the light of Maine that I'm, I'm, work I'm still working on. Yeah. When, when, what brought you to Stonington? Were you at Haystack? Stonington brought me John Martin. Never heard of John Martin. He was a painter, was an American painter. Um, been, let's say in between a figurative and abstract war artist, uh, an artist that I love very much. And yes. John Martin lived, uh, spent a lot of time in, in uh, Sonnington, Maine. So I said to myself, I want to go where this painter walked. You know, I want to go in the place and I, I paint in the site. That's, that's very important. Yeah, that's John Murray. And so I found out also why he, he, he drew and he painted those, those strange structures that actually are the, the pillars that we also have here in Eastport, the wooden pillars. <laughs> the old, they, they, they uh, you know, they, they lean all over. They, they are not really straight. And uh, from Stonington, I went, a friend of mine told me, why don't you go to Eastport? And so I came here in 2017, and I started uh, uh, actually taking films, uh, little videos, and um, and then I started painting um, and studied the light, the light, winter and summer and spring, all seasons. And the light here is beautiful, especially in inter winter. It's beautiful. I think I I don't sleep much, so. I wake up very often at four o'clock and I go down to the pier to take picture of the sun, sunrise. Sunrise here is spectacular. It's much better than in, mid, in the middle of the ocean. I don't know why. There must be a scientific reason for that, right? So you're making me very homesick. <laughs> well, I have to say that the sunrise and sunset here in central Illinois can also be very spectacular. And, and it has its own light and everything, but 
You're making me very nostalgic for down by the water. <laughs> well, yeah, well, the water, the, the, water, <laughs> the water is important. You know, I, I have to say, Victoria, I, I have this sense of this non-permanence as a very positive thing. Everything uh, you're doing is, is flowing. It's almost like it's all film. It's, it's, it's everything, every sketch you do, every painting, it's like it just keeps uh, moving. I, I, I just a sense of it from what you're saying and how you're thinking about what you're doing. I, I, um, it's just uh, amazing to me, you know, the, you're changing almost the definition of, of painting and drawing into something much more dynamic than I've ever thought of it as. So. Oh, thank you. Well, you, you know, I am, a, I, 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 I am nothing in my life than I just have uh, my my life and my art are the same thing, you know. I don't have a family. I don't. I don't even have a house. I live in hotels or B&B or rooms or temporary place because I feel free. I need to be free. So uh, how do you uh, uh, like now? So what is your studio? I mean, what's the studio space you're working in now? Uh, just. Um, well, depends. It depends on the size, depends on what I want to do. I've been working in any kind of uh, room, also in hotel room. I uh, sometimes have bigger places. For example, last year in this summer, I painted on a sale, a real sale, a jeep, a real sale delight of Eastburg. I did some sale and I needed a, a bigger place. So I had uh, a friend who actually gave me the possibility, the opportunity to to spend one month or two months. The, it's very important to understand that all my projects, all my ideas, they are born in my brain and the computer, actually the studio is my computer. Yeah. Even if it's all, it's, everything is there. And when I really realize and I make the objects, that can happen in a month or two. I don't need to elaborate uh, something on, uh, uh, on a big scale. Everything uh, starts as a photo, starts as a theory, starts as a study of an art uh, book, and then little by little it becomes also uh, a visual object, you know? So that's why I don't really, I'm not a studio person. And another thing, I like to work with other people. That's for me, it's very important. I did a lot of collaboration with other artists, uh, uh, composer, um, dance, choreographer, because for me, um, well, art is really a way of communication and uh, exchange ideas, and uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, a solitary artist, let's say, you know. That's also any any kind of people. I can collaborate with any 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 people. Not 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 uh, necessary an artist. Everything that a meeting with a person for me is always an exchange of knowledge. You know, that's that's I think is the role of the arts in our society to enrich our experience, our knowledge. For, any kind of media, any kind of person. I have to go. Thank you. Thank you, Clean. Oh, before, you, before you go, I want to show the portrait that I was working on. Oh, great. Victoria. Ah, uh -huh, let me see. I can see it. <laughs> That's beautiful. Wow. I like the glasses. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. And here Sue is working on one too. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, a few philosophers around the edges, too. Yeah, right, right. And who says the portrait is dead? <laughs> no, but I mean, the portrait, you don't have, I don't have to recognize myself. You, I can recognize the shadow, the shades, the head, I mean, the character. That's what Raphael wanted to yeah. do. To show the people well, the Clint, Clint, we're here on this um, on this channel every Friday morning at at nine a.m. So you you're welcome. About some artists or some We we yes we all I try to have a featured artist almost every week or I also.
also say a featured creative. There, it's not always artists. So mm -hmm. We have designers or thinkers or uh, strategists, etc. And Devin is yeah. next week, right? Next week we have a Portland-based artist uh, named Devin Kelly Yardem, and uh, yeah, they, they they used to live up here in Eastport. We went to Pratt Institute together. They should be yeah, that's great. great. Very great. All right. Good to meet you, Clint. It's good to meet you, Clint. Well, thank you very much. The ways that you sketch. One of the things we talk about and I think about a lot in my own work, or one of the things you'll hear me say over and over again is, you know, it's all, it's all about having a mile at the end of your pencil or a mile at the end of your creative tool. And it's about, it's about the act of creation and the process of creation being the goal. Yeah. And, and not necessarily that which you create, but the, the time and the energy and the thought process of, of the creation. And it seems like your philosophy of creating is very well aligned into that idea. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. I, I mean, I think we had uh, already a lot of masterpiece but <laughs> from the past, but the, the way of creating, also because we have new medium, I mean, think about, I can use, for example, a digital prints on my canvas, I can use an emul a photographic uh, emulsion, and so, so that's, that allows you to, to have much more steps in the process, you know what I mean? technical prep. Pre uh, uh, I can go to a, a lab and uh, prepare my canvas or any kind of surface before painting. See, it's interesting. Oh, well, of course, in the past they have a workshop, what they call Bottega, but it was like a, a, a it, it was like a, 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 a very structure and uh, they went step by step and because they needed the, the final work. Uh, in our society we have so many images from everywhere that uh, uh, I think it's more important the process than the final result in a way. Unless you don't need to, to uh, use a final result out there for some reason, which can be architecture, I mean, decorations. Or, but but uh, the result of the process is also interesting because you can, it changes. You can see in my work, so you, every day you can see different things. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank because you. It's, thank it's, you. it's full of details that. I hope to really to publish the book so it's, it's much more visible, much more clear, the process, because every page is a different, you know, it's sort of like an animation thing. <laughs> you know, I love animation, but, by the way, but, yeah, I think I... want to read that book. Yeah, definitely. I like animation. The book that you had um, open, uh, that has a picture of the original Raphael. This is a brochure. Yeah. This is a brochure yeah, because... What, what is this book? Well, this is a brochure that now has been printed by uh, Greg Gard in the gallery where I did, I have these three pieces here, uh, the gallery. Uh, 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 I thought I it might be something like that. Yeah, and a brochure that I did just uh, uh, some years ago when I did the first solo show. I can show you other works. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, and it's a brochure that I used in during the uh, to present my work during the show, you know. And uh, see, this is uh, some of the passage uh, that I did in uh, okay. making. Okay. 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 Yeah. Right, great. But the text that I wrote, for example, this is a background of another card that I used. This, this is a, a silk screen. No. This is a silk screen. The, the yellow. The green thing. So in the, in the book that, that my this is more an explanation, the explanation of uh, 
uh, the presentation of the show that I did in Turin and then I did I uh, did here also in East, but uh, um, but uh, the text that I wrote is more theoretical. The uh, I'd be interested in, uh, in in knowing how we could maybe get a, a, a hold of that book, a copy of that. Yes. Yeah. Is that available to? Oh, it, uh, well, I'm I'm working on it. I'm working on it. It hasn't been published yet. I'm translated. Oh, I translated. That, yeah. That this book has not been published. This one? Oh yeah. yeah. This one can be reproduced. I know. It, this is a, this is a brochure that can be reproduced in a digital way. It's so actually it's a PDF. Oh, yeah. Actually, if you, go, if you go to Victoria's website, there's she's quite a lot of content on oh, there. Okay. And there, there's a link to that in my Patreon. So oh, there is. Okay. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Yeah. But would it be interested in pursuing that for? Um. Uh, I. I think there is this brochure also online. No, but yeah. they can have that copy. Or you can, I can have a PDF of it. Yeah. I have a PDF. Or you can have a copy of the PDF. If yeah. you write to me, if you write to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm, I so, uh, uh, will you go back home next? Uh, well, I don't have a home. Yeah. I uh, go back, I never want to go back anywhere. Go See, back. my idea is go forward. Go, go forward. But uh, since I am a good girl, that's the most, most important thing. You can do whatever you want, but you have to be in good. Oops. Everything disappeared. Yeah, I don't know if it terminated on her end. Here, the computer. Doesn't work. Mm. You may not have had power going to that. Yeah, battery probably ran out. It should have been on the battery, but I mean, it should have been on the cord, but I guess it wasn't. Yeah, now it's getting power. Um. <laughs> well, it, you know. It happens. It happens sometimes. They pretty much already wrapped it all up. No, I was to say goodbye. Victoria, I'll go home and I'll put all that video on this blank DVD and give it to you. You can pick it up or something. Right? Oh, in the pan? Uh, DVD there. Do you have a pen? Do you have a flash drive? I don't have yeah. one. Yeah. Do you have a USB? I do. Okay. Let's put in a USB and then you turn it with a pen. Because yeah. I don't have other DVDs. Yeah, just, uh, if you got a flash drive, you give me yeah, that. I'll put, I'll put no, it No, I, I don't have a flash drive so big. So you, you don't have any? No. You can go buy one down the dollar store, I think. Where? Uh, down the family dollar. Oh, okay. I think they have one down Oh, there. that's a good idea. So, well, we have time. Yeah, no problem. Not in a hurry. That's I think they probably are.